Hi everyone, this is Dan Clanton, and this is our mini-lecture on Augustine. Of all the major figures in Christianity, Augustine ranks only behind Paul in the significance of his work and his theological impact. We know that his mother Monica was a devout Christian, but his father Patricius was a pagan, that is, was not a member of Judaism or Christianity. Monica had raised Augustine as a Christian, but had not had him baptized. At school in Carthage, he read Cicero's Hortensius, a work now lost, that exhorted its reader to study philosophy and to beware one's body. This is an inheritance of Neoplatonic thought that claimed that the material, including the body, was inferior to the spiritual. Our body is disgusting, it's gross, and it's base, and it is beneath contempt. It has all kinds of smells and sounds, and you have hair where you don't want hair, and where you like hair, you often do not have hair. Uh, that is, the physical is always less than the spiritual. This idea resonated both with Augustine's intellectual tendencies as well as the struggles he'd been having with his own sexuality. Now, he was no hedonist, but he had kept a concubine since the age of 16, and she'd bore him a son named Adeodatus. When he tried to find the same philosophical speculation and richness of thought he had found in Cicero in biblical literature, he was very disappointed, though. During his schooling in Carthage, Augustine also became a devotee of Manichaeism. This group, which was considered a heresy, had several beliefs Augustine found philosophically intriguing. They believed that Jesus was a human form of divine light and the second part of a trinity that included God and Mani, their founder, who'd been sent by the light to deliver the gospel to the world. They also embraced asceticism, which Augustine was finding more and more attractive, Asceticism is the practice of bodily degradation and the denial of one's baser instincts. So this would include fasting and celibacy in an attempt to push down our baser instincts and focus or emphasize on our higher spiritual aspirations. Finally, not believing that God could be entirely good due to the presence of evil and suffering in the world, they postulated the existence of two deities. And as such a constant struggle between good and evil would one day erupt into the eschaton, into the end of days. While Augustine found many of Manichaeism's ideas in stimulating, he had read enough of the Greek natural philosophers to know that some of their explanations didn't accord with the science of his day. When he expressed his concerns to his Manichaean friends, they told him to wait for Faustus, one of the most influential and charismatic Manichaean teachers. However, when Faustus finally showed up, Augustine found him more style than substance. We might say he was more fizz than gin. He was disappointing, and so Augustine was left trying to determine on what intellectual bases should I base my life. After this disappointment, he decided to leave Carthage and pursue his teaching career in Rome, where he encountered the famous Bishop of Milan, Ambrose, and decided that his new job of court orator necessitated the dismissal of his concubine. It was also at Rome where Simplician, the mentor of Ambrose, introduced Augustine to both the letters of Paul and Christian Neoplatonism. Both of these schools of thought would prove very influential to Augustine's thought. After a time of soul-searching, he finally converted to Christianity in August of 386 and was baptized after extensive preparation the following spring. Following his conversion, he eventually and reluctantly became a bishop and began his writing career. Two of his works, The City of God and his Confessions, have become classics. In these and other works, Augustine lays out his ideas about original sin, the fall of man, and predestination. 
prominent British monk named Pelagius made a splash in his claims that God could not be just if humanity were punished for its sins without providing a way to help ourselves. In other words, there must be a way for humans to help themselves with sin. God will help those who help themselves, right? Augustine disagreed vehemently, arguing that God helps precisely those people who cannot help themselves. If we could save ourselves somehow, then of what use was Jesus' suffering and death? That is, why did Jesus have to suffer and die on behalf of humanity if humanity could have done something, anything, to alleviate the weight of sin? William Plater and Derek Nelson write, quote, Through grace, God saves some people in spite of their inability to save themselves. Nothing they have done merited that salvation, yet Scripture insists that God's grace does not extend to all. There are goats as well as sheep. Some are consigned to eternal fire. God must therefore simply decide to save some and leave others, no worse in their characters, to the consequences of their sins. Is that unfair? Augustine argues that everyone sins, so everyone deserves punishment. God gives some better than they deserve, but no one gets less. Now, the implication of this theory is that no one can claim to have earned salvation. That is, salvation is not attainable through works, but only through grace, a claim that will become very important in the 15th century to an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. The presupposition of Augustinian predestination is that humanity is sinful, even babies. So why is this the case? Why is humanity steeped in sin? Augustine, interpreting the narration of the disobedient act in the garden in Genesis chapters 2 to 3, claims that it's because humanity in general has inherited what he called original sin. That is, Adam committed a heinous sin by disobeying God, and that sin is somehow transmitted to all of his descendants. Taking a cue from the idea of Jesus' virginal conception and birth, Augustine asks what it is about human sexuality that necessitated Jesus be born in that fashion. Put differently, why is it that Jesus alone had to be born of a virgin? What caused that? Augustine's answer is that in some way, the sin of Adam is transmitted through sexual intercourse or semen, and as such, Jesus needed to be born without those measures in order to rescue humans from sin. In his work, Peter Brown notes that in conceiving Jesus with no sexual act, Mary recaptures the perfect harmony and companionship Eve must have felt prior to the disobedient act, and it's this harmony of body and will that Augustine so emphasized and so sought for himself. It's important to note that Augustine doesn't feel sex in and of itself is evil. It's a gift of God and is to be celebrated. Adam and Eve had even had sex in the garden, but since we're all now drowning in sin, sex, like all other activities, has become tainted. Our will has been subsumed to our desires when it should be the other way around. In summary, this insistence on the inherent sinfulness of humanity, as well as the physical cause for that condition, led to an increased interest in monasticism, asceticism, and a greater interest in Mary. All key traits of medieval Christianity. This has been our mini lecture on Augustine. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to your feedback.